How is everybody doing today? I'm, I'm really excited. There's a ton of you here to learn about the really complicated stuff TCP does. That's really exciting. I expected there to be like three people here, and then there would be three people just cheer me on. Go. So we're still waiting on a uh, power cable, and then we'll be ready to go. But before that, I want to get a selfie of you guys with me, so if that's not weird. So uh, if I get a share of hands, um, a show of hands, who here works with Node on a daily basis, even at home, at work, whatever, just they use Node all the time, right? And so uh, if you can keep your hand up if you do more than web servers, so if it gets uh, like command line, anything else, keep your hands up. So significantly less. And that's, this is what this talk's kind of centered around, is when I was learning Node myself, I ran into an issue where you couldn't find much information on things outside of web servers. And it became really frustrating because Node has a wonderful library of things it can do. And today we're talking about more of the TCP stack. Um, but that's kind of important to building your transit layer, transport, transport layer. So my name is Jonathan Yarber. I am a CTO and co-founder of a local startup here in Oklahoma called Nodecraft. We do game servers, uh, just basically making it easier for people to play online together. Uh, when I'm not in front of a computer working on JavaScript, I'm in front of a computer playing games or uh, tabletop games with my friends. Basically, all around nerd, that whole cliche. Um, so, uh, you can find me online at Blaze Double D, GitHub, Twitter, the whole nine yards. So, we should probably start on what a transport layer actually is. To some people, it's this big, scary word that you hear your sysadmin talking about. And uh, if you even look at like the Wikipedia article, it's you know talking about a lot of really complex things. But uh, if I know JavaScript developers very well, you kind of want this TLDR of it really comes down to how do your applications talk to each other, but securely and reliably talk to each other, because that's what's really important at the end of the day. And so a lot of this talk kind of came down from uh, what we were learning and building when we were working on Nodecraft and how we were scaling a lot of the stuff we were doing uh, because we were working with a lot of the newer technologies and we're building something kind of atypical for how most people use Node. So uh, a lot of this may be a little bit biased in how we've learned or what we've learned in w when building Nodecraft. So keep that in mind. So uh, briefly get this out of the way because I don't want to feel like this is plugging. <laughs> But um, so the best description of what we're doing, it's basically Heroku for game servers. Uh, we're taking processes on a remote device, starting it, managing it, and monitoring its output, taking care of the files, basically trying to almost remotely snipe a different server, potentially in a different data center in different regions of the world. So I mean, again, to come back to the whole developer analogy, it's really like uh, doing PM2, but again, different data centers. And so uh, a lot of the challenges we had was we couldn't really build something like a REST network because of the design strategies behind uh, running multiple different REST servers and or uh, finding a, a best solution for how to build these things out. So we had a, real a few challenges. Obviously, the first and foremost being remote networks. You know, how do you deal with different data centers? A lot of uh, transport, layer, transport layers like to be in a secluded private network or won't have security because they expect to be there. So that's obviously the biggest uh, challenge you may have to immediately deal with. And obviously latency is really important, especially with game servers, uh, where uh, you know a delay on a website, three seconds, doesn't mean, a big, didn't mean much to loading a page you might not even notice, versus a game, that's where the controller gets thrown across the floor, and that's you know typical how that goes. Uh, we also have an issue with persistence. Because we're wanting to make sure that our servers are online and constantly available, we know when an issue comes along. Building REST, you kind of have to wait until something breaks. It's a lazy request. And you say, oh, I can't make my request now, versus knowing exactly when it happens. And that's the thing we want to kind of build into our transport layer, so we know when something goes wrong, when it happens, and we don't have to rely on some kind of monitoring system. And uh, obviously, the next big challenge we have is uh, when we're running game servers, they're just a process. So like Heroku, it has output. And we want to monitor the output for events, player joined, or server started, server crashed. 
And we want to get this to the browser, but we also want to monitor it for events, for tracking in our system as it is. And we want to get that to the browser in about 200 milliseconds because we're trying to build something a little more uh, up to date with today's technologies. So um, we have another issue where we have thousands of game servers producing output constantly every second. So we have this potential runaway where we create more output that we can monitor. So that's another issue our transport layer has to deal with, so high volume. And so to, to kind of uh, see what that looks like, I don't know if you can see this or not it, in the back, let me know if you have a problem. But this is our new Relic stats from yesterday. Uh, so at a week, doing about 62 million requests in a week. And in fact, since we started the talk, or actually since this morning, we've done about uh, 273,000 TCP requests and only about 8,000 REST requests. That's, uh, you can see the requests per second, averaging about 200. And so it's hard to do a lot of these things in REST because of its design, we'll get to that later. Um, but this is kind of give you an idea of what we're dealing with today in production. This is actually live stream from our production server right now. So when we were first building this trans transport layer, we had a few goals in mind. What do we want to build? This is the important part of selecting a technology, selecting a protocol you want to use. And the first and foremost is the guaranteed delivery. You need to know that your message got to the server you expected it to go to. If it wasn't received, you need to know that it wasn't received. Similar to like response codes on a REST server, you want to know what's going on. And second to that, you have security, of course. You want to make sure that you don't have man in the middle attacks, a server in the middle reporting the data as different, or someone getting into your servers where they shouldn't have access to it. And of course, to counter that, you have service discovery. How does your server in Amsterdam know how to talk to your API server, or should it, or should it know of the extraction layer of it knows how to talk to controller or the uh, API controller, but doesn't actually know where it is. So you have to keep service discovery and security kind of in check. Um, fault tolerance is also really important. If you look at companies like Netflix, where they constantly take down certain parts of their network to test to make sure it's to fault tolerant, you want to make sure your transport layer doesn't have a single point of failure just on how it's delivering its messages. And of course, you know, and kind of contrary to everything above it, performance is still kind of one of the more important aspects. If it doesn't, if it's not fast, what are you getting out of it? And uh, of course, another uh, thing, a part of that as well, is how low profile as a client, is it going to cause you to have you know, significant hardware requirements if you're doing different types of protocols or different types of encryption? That's also really important to how you build your clients out. And for me, the most important part, of course, built in Node. We do our entire stack on Node, which doesn't have to be uh, your requirements, because you can do TCP in pretty much any language, but for us, it was important to build something that we can run in Node as it is. And to kind of, of course, cover that, what can you actually build in Node? You've got, of course, what we're talking about today is TCP, which you're already familiar with, if you know it or not, in any kind of HTTP or REST server, WebSockets as well. And again, what we're talking about is building your own. And of course, you can actually even do stuff like UDP, which is really cool to do, and we'll talk about that again later and as well as file sockets, which is something that most people don't really use very often, but when you're on your own uh, single device, you can create a uh, file socket to communicate like you would in TCP when using Node.js. And of course, not everybody can build their own, or perhaps you don't have the time, or your boss is like, oh, we needed it yesterday, and that whole spiel. So uh, you have things like ZeroMQ. Uh, a lot of banks use this for higher transaction rates. Uh, there's also a RabbitMQ and a myriad of different commercial services. In fact, we launched using a commercial service before we built our own just so we can get out the doors. So when you're building a REST network, you end up with this, I apologize, there's only three diagrams. You don't have to worry about this too much. So um, in a REST design, you really have this situation where every server is plugged into another server. You never have this central point where you can assume everything's connected together but you know, if your cache server goes offline, all of your other servers are unable to talk to it, or they have to figure out what's going wrong. So you have a collective problem that you have to figure out what's going wrong versus a uh, issue where they're connected at one point. And so in talking about those goals we had, guaranteed delivery, of course, you know, your REST codes are perfect. I mean, there's not really much else you're gonna expect in terms of knowing when you have that guaranteed delivery or not. 
Security, I assume to be poor only because with the asterisk of there's a lot more attack vectors in using a REST network because there's things you have to think about that you may be missing. Uh, a, a prime example of that is the Mozilla service where they were saving files on a server and they just uh, changed it instead of an HTTP website to a file on the remote device and they're able to uh, compromise their devices by just exploiting something they didn't expect in the uh, REST the protocol. Uh, service discovery is poor compared to other things you might be able to do. Uh, you're basically doing DNS and that's about it. Fault tolerance is great because you can do load balancing. Uh, performance uh, is tends to be poor because you end up having to set middleware or these things to keep revalidating this new request to be who you expect it to be. Are you still the same server? Is your token still valid? Are you the same IP address? You have this issue of there's no real persistent connection in most REST networks. And of course, the low profile client, you can use CLI, so it's not exactly the most difficult thing to approach. Um, the, it does have cons, and sorry, pros and cons both, of being incredibly easy to develop. You can throw a web developer at a REST network, he knows what's going on pretty quick. You have any language, and it's, there's, there's not much to it in terms of complexity compared to the other different uh, transport layers. And of course, you do have a problem with, like I said before, the performance and attack vectors being much, much more significant. So before we move on to TCP or UDP, we need to talk about a different design strategy. Perhaps we need to do things in a model we like to use, like publish and subscribe. Basically, you want to have uh, parts of your applications publishing data, other applications subscribing to that information, and perhaps even responding, depending on your uh, design, so that you can listen for certain events, reply to them on a TCP or UDP network. What this gives you is this real-time status of your network. So you can do things like knowing exactly who's connected persistently to your network. You uh, se secure the identity when they connect to the device, and you can ensure that on encryption that they're never the wrong person that you're, uh, you're or wrong application you were talking to originally. Um, you can also you know, set up multi-master servers so that you simply publish to a different server, it passes to the other server, and then again to your actual client. And I'll show you a diagram here in a minute, what that actually looks like. And what this actually really does is this means you have a server which isn't involved in the actual data itself, it's just involved in making sure the data is secured and reliably sent to the correct uh, person you're wanting to send it to, and that the sending uh, application is also secure and the correct application sending it from. So when you use UDP, it ends up looking like this, where you have these distributors in the middle here, um, which is what we call them. There's probably better names for them out there <laughs> than what we like to call them. But basically, you publish your data to the server in the middle, which it passes it where it needs to go, and then you subscribe again to those servers asking for that information. The one problem with UDP is you'll see there's two lines on every connection because you have to connect to the distributor, and the distributor has to connect to you. But you do have the added benefit of your web server, for example, won't know where your cache server is. It knows an abstraction of what you're, how to talk to your cache server, but it never has a direct connection directly to it. And when there is problems with that cache server, the distributor will know there's an issue and can kick your uh, request back uh, instantly without timeouts or anything like that. And so UDP, of course, isn't still ideal for our situation. There's lots of situations where you might want to consider UDP, but the most glaring problem with UDP is that it's by design doesn't give you a good solid uh, guarantee of delivery. So often when you're using UDP, your network connection can be entirely stable, but you uh, have a problem where one of the servers you're uh, connecting through, just a middle server that's passing your connection off, has a moderately high CPU, not even a high percent like 90 or 100, but just above average, and it says, I'm too busy, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna ignore this for now, and then your UDP packet was lost entirely in the chain. So uh, you have almost no guarantee of delivery um, compared to like TCP where it actually echoes back, so when you send a request to a server, it echoes back and says, I got that request by its ID. So UDP, again, is a different strategy. It's also an older technology, but doesn't really give you that guaranteed delivery. Uh, security, service discovery, um, 
sorry, security is about as good as your published subscribe number is gonna be. It's as good as you can program it, but in published subscribe, you have that persistence of connections. Uh, so security is improved from what I consider uh, REST networks. Um, service discovery is more difficult because you do again have to connect both ways. TCP still does the same thing, but it does it for you in a way you don't have to actively monitor and pay attention to. So it's actually a lot more easy to develop at the end of the day. Uh, fault tolerance uh, is really kind of dragged down by the guaranteed delivery as it is. You know, how do you make something fault tolerant if you didn't, if you don't know you can get a guaranteed delivery in the first place? But the upside of all this is that your performance is near perfect. It's fast. Uh, when you send TCP, like if you have a latency from, let's say, New York to New Zealand, you're going to have about 200 milliseconds of latency. And so TCP that goes back and forth, 200 to get to the other server, 200 back. So it's 400 milliseconds of latency where UTP will just be the mere 200 because there is no callback. So uh, again, pros being it's fast, cons being that it's literally ultra hard mode to develop for. Anything you want is gonna have to be hand developed by you explicitly. So uh, if you wanna know if someone's persistently connected, you have to develop that. If you wanna do a connection handshake and make sure it connects back to the server, you have to develop that. So it's, it, there is options where you wanna use this, but in our situation, TCP was definitely the answer. This is nearly identical to the other diagram, except for we only have one connection for us to worry about. And once that's connected, we'll know of the persistence and we'll have that active connection with each distributing server. So um, for us, we had no flaws in any of our goals. Guarantee of delivery, we know when a server is connected or not. We have TCP, which guarantees a delivery, or we know it didn't happen. So there's no question of if a message was received or not. Security is as great as publish, subscribe again, as we mentioned before. Service discovery, publish, subscribe. Uh, fault tolerance, we have multiple servers, there's no issue there. Um, its performance isn't as great as UDP, but it's still uh, a lot smaller footprint than REST because you can only send what you want to, you don't have to worry about headers, you don't have to worry about all these extra things that you would in REST. Uh, and of course, again, it's a low profile client because you're just sending TCP, your client doesn't have to worry about all these extra things, it's just worrying about sending messages and receiving messages. Um, it's great! So um, the pros being obviously it's, it's kind of everything we want it to be. The cons can still be things, it's still difficult to develop. For a lot of people you start talking about building UTP, uh, TCP networks and they kind of give you this deer in the headlights like I've never done that before. Uh, you do have to bring a little bit of your own protocol and how you want to talk to your servers, how you want to authenticate, but it's actually not that difficult and we'll, we'll work on this later. Um, and the other real con is that encryption will be a little bit slower because you don't have a lot of the same technologies uh, REST has been given to improve that performance of encryption. But that could be very wrong. <laughs> this is just our, from what we've seen uh, in what we're doing in, with uh, TCP. And of course, the extra bonus also with TCP is that you can actually do file socket code for just mounting to a file. Instead of going to a port and address on the internet, you have a file you just send and receive uh, your packets to. And that never gets to the internet. You just have to worry about your uh, permissions. And it's the same code base as TCP. So you could actually have a private network and a public network doing different things, but same code base, which is always a bonus. So let's look at some actual TCP code. And I don't mean like, let's look at a framework, let's look at raw TCP code. And in this, in this actual example, we're not gonna go as deep as pub sub because that's a lot more complex than we have time for today. We're gonna look at just a basic TCP example. So in this right here, where did my mouse go? We have a server. We're just using the net library that the node provides, Lodash as a utility. And there's a really nice library called JSON stream, which just uh, pipes JSON data into a write stream, uh, or a read stream, excuse me. So you can actually ensure that your data is coming in as JSON, rather than sending raw data. So it's as simple as creating your server with net.createServer. There's a couple arguments you wanna check the documentation for. We wanna handle and track connections so we know who's connected 
perhaps do some authentication. Of course, log your errors, set the server up, and then gracefully close the server. That last part's a little more optional. Not many people still do that today, even with like express servers. So to kind of dive into these things a little more, we want to track our connections and provide an ID. For the sake of uh, this example, I just did a numeric incremented ID here. Typically, you want to do something a little more stronger than that. Um, but for here, this is good enough. So you have an ID. This is merely a handle for you to operate with this client uh, for later transactions, tracking their authentication, kicking them out if they're doing nefarious things. You need a handle of some sort to work with. Since we're sending JSON, we want to set our encoding to UTF-8. That's just kind of step one. Next, we have this option called no delay. And what this really is, is it's uh, part of an algorithm that uh, Nagel or Nagali, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that last name, uh, created that basically is designed to save you bandwidth uh, by sending X messages in X percent of traffic based off of your throughput. Um, which is really ideal uh, if you don't have a data center connection or you're trying to save bandwidth. But it has the uh, problem where you will simply wait to send messages. So if it's time and time restrictive, you want to disable that. For, so that's what we actually do as well. So um, from there, it's just a matter of uh, logging. Client is connected. We're going to create a nice helper function to send, which is simply client.write, client being a writable stream. Uh, we're going to JSON stringify and just send it out. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and pipe any data coming in through this JSON stream so that when we get raw text in, it'll just pipe it out as JSON data and only valid JSON data. Anything else is just be dropped. So when we get it here, we actually have a full blown uh, JSON object. Um, we're actually just going to echo it back in this example. Um, from there, you just simply want to deal with issues like if the client had an error, if you don't log these, obviously you'll crash, or you deal with these in your own respect. The same example, we're just going to log them. And of course, you want to do some cleanup as well. Once the client connection's closed, we no longer want to track that client. So when we're doing things later, for example, like uh, cleanup, we don't have to disconnect that client, obviously, because you'll actually get an error if you try doing that. Subsequently, the client is actually really simple. You again use the net library. We're going to go ahead and use Lodash and JSON stream again. Uh, we simply connect to the server, set our settings again, set our encoding, disable the algorithm, and handle uh, errors and events as we would normally. Once we've connected, it's a simple fact uh, a matter of doing again the same thing, same code base you saw on the server. You send the JSON stream, you receive uh, JSON uh, data. We're going to pipe that again through the parser, and that's really basically it. So it's really approachable, and it's much more approachable when you start looking at frameworks. And for us, this is really difficult to work with constantly, so we actually ended up making a framework. And as of yesterday, it went live on NPM, and is now an open source project you can look at today. We call it Ricochet, because it's still using the publish subscribe network or, uh, design, so you're never actually sending directly to a client. You send it to the distributing server, which sends it to your client, so it's kind of ricocheting off. That's our cliche, uh, cheesy uh, reason for that name, I guess. So um, Ricochet uh, is real, real uh, similar to how you would handle a, a request in like Express. It makes it much more approachable, um, much more easy to dive into. It's easy to create multi-tenant servers. Uh, you publish and subscribe via what we call channels, which is just like a handle, like a URL would be. Your uh, functions, it, it operates on basically uh, event meters, so you just on whatever you're sending out, handle the data, and you emit uh, events back to it. So nothing new to learn there. And it really relies on two different methods, requests and messages. Messages are just a have this data, I don't care what happens. Similar to UDP, it's really great for things like uh, stat reporting, what's the percentage of CPU, that kind of information. And requests are uh, simply uh, like REST is. You send a request, you expect a reply, but it has the added bonus of we have it set up to receive updates. So if, for example, if you're downloading a file, you can see the percentage of the updates in real time coming in through TCP, rather than just waiting for that initial like, when's it gonna get downloaded, you're just sitting there spinning. It's nice to have. So to look at some code, and it was small enough I could actually fit it into my presentation, um, we have our Ricochet client. 
we pass it in some configuration, which is basically going to be um, its IP address it's binding to, and then uh, some authentication data. And I can show this, I'll show this to you in a minute. And uh, what we do is simply uh, create a request um, as this will become a uh, event handler at this point. So request to some channel, this could be a API server, cache server, whatever your name of your channel is, and we're telling it the command of file.download. It didn't have to be structured like this. This is exactly how you want it to be, just this is how we're structuring it. And we're gonna say download this Thunder Plains image. That's all we're doing. Once we get updates, we'll console log that the progress is happening. On a response, we know that it's done. And there's actually even an error, which I couldn't quite fit in here, but you'd still wanna track errors the same way you would normally. And it would be emitted as an error in the callback here, which makes it easier to deal with as a function or even uh, push through like a Promiseify network or function as well. On the other side, you would want to subscribe to that connection. Same thing, create a client, configure its connection, uh, connection um, and handle file download. You'll get a payload of data and an event handler. Looks similar, right? So we're going to use the wget module of uh, npm to download the file. On progress from that, we'll simply emit an update to our handler, and then once that's done, we'll issue a response and again we would emit an error instead and that would come back to uh, the error in this callback here so not much is changing in what you're expecting or what you're getting used to um, from how you've already been doing stuff in node so um, now it's the demo time where we get to actually use this monstrosity below us so is it a uh, is it online oh has it been running the entire time Okay, I had no idea. <laughs> so um, this right here is running on Ricochet code. Is the uh, iPad on you? Cool, so we're actually using Socket.io from the server in the middle below the iPad to uh, emit events to the actual iPad. It's using a web browser. The rest of these are just connected on regular Ricochet clients. And that looks something like this over here. Oops, we have a server. We require uh, Ricochet. We uh, have a configuration file, which is simply, uh, you might have this in a database, such as RethinkDB, um, where uh, you simply ch save what channel it is, what IP it's coming on. Uh, that's how we end up doing a lot more security, is making sure that that connection is coming on an IP address. We have a group mechanism so that we can actually isolate sockets, for example. A socket uh, traffic could never come into uh, R1, for example, the Pi over here. And the rest is just uh, about encryption. You have a public key, private key, and off key. And those are used to uh, deal with encryption in Ricochet itself. So this is actually all that you have to return um, and when they do authentication, but how you handle it is up to you. So like before, we're gonna tra uh, track our channels. So we care about those channels from our configuration. We're just gonna say by default they're not connected. Um, we actually have to set this uh, off callback when somebody does connect. So every time someone connects, this will be run. And we're just gonna check it against our JSON uh, file here. It's if they're there and everything matches what it should matches, then return that client. Uh, behind the scenes, Ricochet will do more to authenticate. It's just looking for the data source to come in and be relevant. We'll go ahead and log things like when the authentication fail, or a client's ready, errors, that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, we wanna handle things like when a client's ready, we're simply going to track the channel as being alive. And uh, in this example, this is the server code right here, where if it had a uh, matrix uh, as well, it showed the status of the network. And I can show that to you again in a minute. And from now, we're just going to uh, emit patterns to our board, which is probably the most complex part of this, but has nothing to do with TCP other than sending the pattern out. So we wait for the uh, matrix board to be ready. We start our server up. We connect to it as a client. The server needs to be a client itself. The server does nothing besides pass messages. And so it's going to look at each channel. If it's online and it's not itself, we're just going to send the pattern that we're currently generating because it's seeing the same pattern to all these at the same time. A client is going to look effectively like this. Uh, again, uh, that's the wrong one, sorry. We want this one. All right, so same thing. We uh, uh, Ricochet, we use Johnny5 for our matrix boards. 
Uh, once the board is ready, we'll go ahead and set the matrix up. From there, we just want to connect to the network and start uh, publishing patterns. And really, all this is right here in this chunk is really just uh, trying to look for events to happen so we know what's going on with the board. So for example, when the server goes off, they'll all know. So it really came down to just handling a single uh, emitted, emitted event pattern and push that to the matrix board. Um, and then obviously doing the socket server is a little more complex, but not terribly. You simply use something like socket IO or web sockets. Um, we're gonna do the same thing when we set up an express server at a certain uh, port. These are all uh, local on this network. This is entirely isolated, no internet involved here. Um, and we're gonna just serve some static files so we can actually serve the uh, web page on the iPad itself. Um, we wish we wanna uh, use Socket.io's rooms to add them to the matrix room so that it sends to that when we have um, new patterns being emitted. So when we get a pattern, we just send it straight out through Socket.io and it arrives on the iPad. And that's really, about all this is. And there's more uh, actually handiwork to get this built than code involved because of Ricochet. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple things real quick and then if we have time, we'll do questions. So I'm pulling off uh, Number four is uh, matrix, and obviously all these servers just lost connection to the servers and died. But when this comes back online, we'll see them reset their connections, and this will actually have a status board of who's online, and this is a really rudimentary way of doing so, but uh, you'd still wanna know what's online and when it's online, and be able to show that in real time. This does take about 30 seconds or so to uh, start up, but it's an example of just trying to track what's actually going on in your network. Waiting on the tiny little LEDs. There we go. So we know that the server itself is connected. This line here says that the WebSocket's connected. Not entirely sure why these guys aren't reconnecting, so let's go ahead and kick them back over. And we can connect this one as well, it's just you can't see the uh, um, matrix happening in real time. But these are all just different Raspberry Pis. So they're a self-contained computer. This isn't Arduino or anything like that. We're just using TCP to send these over. So we saw this one connect. This is number one. It's missing the top the top. Second one connected. Third one, and we'll wait on number four. And as we disconnect these, we'll, we'll see that happen in real time as well. Post. <laughs> Live demos, of course, right? All right, well, the demo didn't work quite as planned. So, uh, if we have time, any questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned REST versus TCP in terms of performance. Do you have any numbers on what the actual uh, order of magnitude or percentage difference was that you guys noticed in your setup? Um, not, we don't have any data that would be relevant anymore because we've since scaled significantly uh, more requests than we used to do. But uh, we don't get, we right now do about 30 milliseconds response time, which is really small, versus before we were doing about 250 on a REST server. So um, that could be a lot about, about our implementation itself, but the design uh, philosophy behind TCP made that far faster. Anybody else? I'm curious while you're uh, going with a string format like JSON instead, maybe BSON or some other binary. Um, really, for this demo, it was just a simple what's easiest to deal with. But when you're sending data over the wire like that, I mean, you might use something like that to reduce your packet sizes so you're not sending unnecessary data. Um, and Ricochet itself, we don't actually use that same library. But for the sake of example today, it was really just about uh, what's going to be easiest to get into. All right, well, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of Thunder Plains.